Hello everyone and welcome to the Museum of American Speed. My name's Tim Matthews, the curator here at the museum, and today I'm super excited. And the reason is I've been visited by my good friend, Mr. Cy Kubista, here from the great state of Minnesota, and he brought along this masterpiece behind me. This is a Model T that has some fantastic history. We're gonna talk a little bit about the car and a little bit about Cy's uh, history. Golly, as we've been walking around the museum, he's just been blowing our mind with all of his connections to all the heroes that we have here at the Museum of Speed. And so uh, it's gonna be an excited, exciting time to talk to Cy and hear about his past and a little bit about this cool hot rod behind me that's going to be on display here for a couple of years. So Cy, welcome to the museum. It's so great to have you here. Well, it's good to be here and, at the, and I'm so happy that it's gonna be here for a while for the other people to see and uh, a lot of work has went into it, uh, and it started way back in 1960 with nothing but a frame and an engine in a one-stall uh, one garage with a Farney arc welder uh, and uh, a torch and a lot of wild ideas. Uh, made a lot of changes through the cars in the years. Well, that makes me feel so happy because you know, in a day where most people are building you know, world-class hot rods in these super fancy facilities where you can eat off of everything. You know, I built my little hot rod in a two-car garage and the reason was is because I wanted to do it the way my forefathers had done it and, and uh, it's just proof that you can build amazing things with very little. And I think a lot of the young people out there that might be listening to this are probably saying the same thing. You know, why should I get involved with the hot rod world? I don't have this big facility. I don't have all the tools I need. But I would argue that if you have the ambition and the passion for it, you can do just about anything. So what year was it that you actually started on this car again, Cy? Uh, uh, 1960. 60, oh boy. There was right. a lot going on in the world in 1960. We were trying to figure out how to go to the moon and all kinds <laughs> of cool stuff. Uh, golly, had you uh, worked on some hot rods before this, kind of oh, leading up to this car? Oh, oh yes, and that there, I'd, I'd actually built um, uh, I'd actually built a Henry J with a V860 in for a guy, and that there I ran a 44 that uh, I ran NHRA drags with uh, in 58, 59, and 60, and I, I ran a stock car, uh, a jalopy car, 1949 Lincoln stock car racing in, in 1955, 56. So I stuck my nose in a lot of a lot of racing. So. I, I had a lot of bruised knuckles and <laughs> a lot of experience in welding, so. Oh, I love that, I love that. Well, kind of to start off, the car behind us was the reason that brought us all together. Why is this car special? It won some pretty spectacular awards. Well, it started out uh, to build a hot rod. Well. Coming back, uh, I was in the service, 53 to 55, in the state of Washington, uh, in the Army, and that there, and I started to see in Washington uh, some hot rods there. So I got kind of the, bur uh, bi the bug to build something, and I come back to Rochester, and, uh, and I said, well, I'm gonna build something that just goofy to, to uh, drive back and forth to work, and that there. So I started with the T. And I actually started driving it in about 63, 64. I drove it to work every day. I put, <laughs> I put a couple thousand miles on it in a, in a year and that there, but uh, it was something new in the area. And uh, I had every cop in Rochester stop me <laughs> to j just to see, you know, what it was, because they had never seen a hot rod. Maybe they seen it on, in a magazine or something, but. Uh, so it was, it was a good time and it was a good attraction because I had opened up a new uh, uh, Phillips 66 station and uh, that parked out in front stopped a lot of people too. So it was a good advertising piece for me. So. Oh, wow. That's just like Ed Iskandarian used to do with his Model T, park <laughs> it out in front of his cam business. I, I didn't realize that. I bet that did uh, get you a lot yeah, of attention. And what was the big show, big award that this car won? Because that was one that really kind of put it on the map, right? Well, in 1968, I won the ISA International 
championship with it. Yeah, that's a big deal. And it got a lot of attention after that. And you were yeah. telling me a little bit about some of the features of the car that you think really put it over the top that made people notice it. Well, I guess the big thing was that everybody ran a Chevy or a small block Ford or, and, and, uh, and here I come along. I got to be a, a Lincoln bug in <laughs> 1952 when the Lincolns first came out with overhead valve and I, I, I just, I just like the sound of that engine. That engine ha has a different sound of, of the other ones. And uh, I said, well, if I ever build something, it's gonna have a Lincoln in it. <laughs> and uh, so I, when I was driving that, then, then I started with, uh, I think I started with one four barrel, then two four barrels, and then three two barrels, and then uh, uh, six two barrels, and then now this one has got eight two barrel carburetors on it. <laughs> and but, they're forced but, but I, fed, yeah. <laughs> I, I kept changing because I, I, I like to have, I have something different, different than the other person. I think because of the Lincoln, you couldn't buy any parts for it. You could maybe buy a distributor and, and uh, rigor parts for it, but all the speed parts you had to make. And uh, I got to know Clay Smith real good, and, uh, camshafts and that, because I think we reground three different shafts for it. <laughs> and that they're just experimenting more than anything. And, and so it, and that with the Edsel push button drive yeah. in the center, uh, that got me a lot of engineering awards. And uh, it being all Ford uh, also helped. Then I, I used to have it uh, up to 1966, it was green. I loved the green. <laughs> and and out there, and one of the judges says, "You will ne you will never get people's award with green." <laughs> and so I brought her home, and I painted it into a maroon and, and reds, and out there, and sure as heck, it started getting people's award. <laughs> and then uh, I had the fenders built, special for it, which is probably one of the highlights. That in the top. The top of the car is, is so much different than, than a lot of them you see. Uh, made the car. It, uh, then I started to really walk away with a lot of the wards and got it seriously in 68 on the, ran 16 shows that year and uh, came out on top. So. That's great. What was it like uh, trying to track, tra I, I love Lincoln engines, by the way. I was just telling you my favorite song about, you know, the hot rod Lincoln, you yeah. know, with the, with the Lincoln motor that's su uh, really souped up. Well, that's right behind me. It doesn't get any more souped up than this. Uh, wh where did you find the engine in those days? Did you go to a salvage yard or did you go to the dealership to get a new motor? <laughs> no, uh, well, I'll tell you, uh, this engine actually started in, in 1957. Uh, I wanted to go drag racing, and my dealer I was working for in Owatonna, Minnesota, says I can get you this Mercury, this M335 built by Bill Strop, and it was 335 horse, and I says, get it, and that there, and uh, we had to do some uh, little changing on it, and that there, but it would reproduce, and that there, I actually. Uh, I was either uh, second or first runner-up or second runner-up at Kansas City with it in the national drags with it in <laughs> Superstock, and uh, so I ran it uh, Superstock in '57 or '57, '58. I ran it with a McCullough on it, which was dumb because uh, that stuck me in into the gas class, and so I thought, well. I want something more aerodynamic, so I put it in a 40 coupe. So I ran it two years in a 44 coupe, 59 and 60. And 60, I at the Minnesota uh, drags, I turned to a new uh, A-gas record. And Daryl and, uh, Zimmerman, who was NHRA director at the time, said, you gotta go to Detroit now to the national, because George Montgomery is the big boy there <laughs> and so I had to run George but I got beat by him 
<laughs> I got beat by a good good half Carly. But I was gonna say, not not he's no slouch. If you're gonna lose to somebody, that'd be an okay guy to lose to. <laughs> yeah. So. <laughs> but uh, I talked to uh, George Montgomery here about oh seven eight years ago, and we were talking about that, and he says. And I said, I was scared of you, and he was scared of me, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, but. Oh, I love that. And, and the push button, uh, where did you find an Etzel push button set up like that back in those days? Just junkyard? Ju junkyard. Well, I, I was uh, 1958. I was a uh, service manager for Etzel in Otana, Minnesota. Oh, wow. So I had, I had plenty of training on it because we had some bugs in the <laughs> new Edsels that we had to iron out first. And so uh, it was uh, nothing for me to cut the, cut the string off and shorten the wires. And You've been there, it, done that. You've, you know how it was all put together. Yes. Yeah, so. oh, tell me a little bit about Ed. I mean, Edsel cars are fantastic history, too. Uh, were they as bad a sellers as everybody makes them out to be? Or did, the, I mean, did they sell a few? Oh yeah, we, we uh, actually we were a, sm a pretty small dealership, and uh, and the opening uh, when we had the grand opening in there, there, I think we had four cars there for the grand opening, and uh, we sold all four, and the owner was mad because we sold his station wagon. <laughs> <laughs> but, but anyhow, uh, you know it was uh, like the Mer the Mercury. It was. Uh, you know, a running year pretty much is just like the 58 Mercury's and that there. So, uh, working all that, lot, all that time for Lincoln, Mercury, and Ford, you know, I was used to it. And that's why we were hired to uh, work on the Edsels. And I thought, they, I thought they were a pretty good car. So. Yeah, a lot of bells and whistles, and they were different. They were big yeah. cars. Um, you told me a fantastic story when we were just walking around yesterday about when you first had a chance to, to test drive your first uh, Lincoln overhead valve uh, like this. Tell, tell me that story again, I loved it. Well, here I am, you know, out of high school in 51 and that there, get hired by this big uh, Ford Mercury Lincoln dealership in Oatana. Uh, there, there was 11 of us back there. There was eight mechanics and a, and a service manager and a couple of uh, two uh, people and uh, they started me on the wash rack, cleaning up used cars and that there. In three months, they had worked me up to the grease rack and small, and small, uh, small jobs. And here comes as they bring the 52 Lincoln in with its overhead valve, of course. It's gonna be showing the next day. And so we, everybody opens the hood up in that there. <laughs> And everybody, wow, what a beautiful, what a beautiful car. The and, valve covers and, and, are cool. I mean, yeah, everything beautiful know, on one of those. And the way the engine ran, so we unconnected the speedometer. <laughs> we go out and, and uh, see how fast it goes and that there, you know. Uh, the owner got a well-broken car when he got it. <laughs> everybody had their turn taking it out for a spin, yeah, wearing so. the back tires off. I love it. Oh, that's great. And uh, you know, it's interesting because you're right. You know, nowadays you see a lot of nail heads, early Hemis, you know, yeah. but you still don't see a lot of Lincolns and hot rods. And you know, that's what makes this car so fantastic and unusual, I think. Well, then the Lincoln wins the road race in 53 and 54. So, you know, that really put, uh, I think I had probably, uh, owned probably 10 or 12 of them. Oh, wow. You don't still have some under your bench. I can come visit you, do you? <laughs> Dang it. No, I want to build a hot rod with I'd a Lincoln now. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I think they're fantastic. And, you know, this car just glows in the dark, you know. And uh, you know, when you look at it, I think the major thing you notice right away is those superchargers hanging out there. You know, now it's big fashion to have these turbos sticking yeah. out of your hood of your Corvette or whatever. You know, this car was way before that. You set the standard, I think, with these two McCullough is hanging out on the fenders. Tell me a little bit about your history with McCullough, because that's cool too. Well, uh, the history with the McCullough is, well, I was in the service in, in 53, 55 in Washington. And uh, anyhow, I had a Lincoln, uh, 49 Lincoln I was driving with carbs and, and heads and that there. And 
us soldiers would go out to the Shelton Dragway, well, it actually was an airport, and we'd drag race for beers on Sunday afternoon, something to do. And uh, I was probably, you know, one of the top th two or three there in a, cor in a Corvette, and in comes driving this 54 Kaiser. And we look at that, you know, and he says, who's top dog? And so I pointed at the Corvette. I says, take him on. He, and that Kaiser beats that Corvette. <laughs> and he comes back over and he says, you're next. And he takes and beats me. And I says, all right. I says, I'll bet you he's got an Oldsmobile. Because it, it, I had seen one on Kaiser before somebody took a 53 Oldsmobile because Kaiser's had hydromatic, so it was an easy switch for them to put the V8 in it. And, and, but here it is, a six-cylinder <laughs> with that little red thing hanging on the side. And I said, what's that? And he says, that's a supercharger. He says, that's my little red school. I'll teach you kids something. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and and, and uh, so I came back to Otana after I, uh, the service that after bought a brand new 55 Mercury Two weeks later, I had a supercharger. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever uh, tinker around with McCullough superchargers in the early days, the ones they made for the flat heads with the, with the big flat yeah. pancakes and triple yeah, drive? I, I, I became a dealer and I started working on them. Oh, sure. For a minute there. Uh, they, had some, they had some problem with the drive unit because the drive unit was brass and they were using engine oil up to the the, the oil, and the, the problem is you let them set for a while, the oil would, uh, back then, would drain off that brass gears, and oh. it would take the drives out. So hmm. we, we, about yeah, that. we repaired quite a few of them at, to begin with, so. Now people look for those like they're hen's teeth, and when they find them, they covet them, and you know, it's very, you see them on a lot of shelves, you see them here at the museum on displays, but it's very rare do you see them on a car running, it's, it's, and that may be the reason is, and they did, they, the early, early ones didn't produce a lot of boost, but these, oh. these were a definite upgrade. The, this yeah, style, McCullough does well, a lot better. Well, these here, I, I, I could get these up to five and a half pounds of boost a piece on them. And after I cut the variable ratio off, and then I could change the, how fast I was spinning them by the size of the crank pulley. Oh, so, sure. Yeah, uh, but. Uh, Do I even need to ask who sells that belt? That is one big, big belt on that car. <laughs> well, I could probably make a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and I'll tell you, it comes off of farmer machinery. Oh, is that right? Yeah. That's cool. And being here in Nebraska, you probably got a few, few, a few laying around, around in some of your implements. Well, that's good to know. I always wondered about that because that is a fantastic, very impressive belt. It actually goes all the way around the, yeah. the fan of the engine, yeah. which is cool. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, and, you know, working with McCullough, you know, doing all this with the, in the hot rod world. I mean, I know Minnesota is kind of a hotbed for hot rodding. Of course, you have the, uh, the Back to the 50s show there, which is always fantastic and draws so many people from everywhere uh, to that event. But what was it like in the early days being from Minnesota? Because in, in this world of hot rodding, you'd be led to believe that everything happened in California. Uh, you know, but you were still doing this in the earlier days uh, in Minnesota where it gets cold well, in the winter. It got a good start in St. Paul and that there. St. Paul and in Minneapolis, you know, started becoming the hot bed, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I think uh, just as much ingenuity came out of Minnesota as it, it came out of California. Uh, the only thing I, I always said about, you know, they can drive their uh, 11, 12 days or a month a year <laughs> where Minnesota, we had to hide them for six months because of, yeah. of the cold and the snow. But, but uh, Do you know those Pines winter fronts that they put on the 32s? I always get a kick out of this. You know, they're super rare. And if you find one, boy, you hit the jackpot nowadays. But they made these Pines winter fronts for these 32s. And now the only guys that can afford them 
are the guys with 32 roadsters in California, which I always think is funny because those Pines winter fronts probably all lived in Minnesota on hot rods and 32s back in the day. But uh, yeah, I just think that's so interesting. Of course, being a, a fellow that was born in Minnesota, raised in South Dakota, you know, you think all the cool stuff's happening somewhere else. But the more you learn about this world, you realize there was a lot going on in Minnesota, Denver, Colorado, you know, with the, with the different superchargers for flatheads and things that were going on there. Uh, so it, it's really neat and it's not every day you get a chance to sit down with one of your heroes uh, of that era, uh, what I like to call the golden era of hot rodding, uh, and, and learn what it was really about. I mean, uh, it's just fun to, to learn how this car was built. We have some fantastic pictures. There's a three ring binder uh, sitting down here by my feet that's about seven inches thick that I'm just dying to to go through to see all the build pictures of the car and we're really going to celebrate it here at the museum. Uh, you know, looking back, is there anything you would have done differently on the car? Uh, you know, if you would have had to build it all over again or is it, did it kind of happen the way it needed to? Well, well, now, now, you know, you got a little smarter. <laughs> every, time, every time you change, you got a little, a little smarter. But I'll tell you, the one thing that, uh, you probably don't realize is that back then, you know, you, we went to a drag strip. You went to a drag strip with a, only a few bucks in your pocket, you know. You went to have fun. Sure, maybe you won a trophy, but, it, you know, it wasn't that big. But you went and there was a lot of, you know, the guy next to you broke about, you helped him fix his car so you could have a race, you know. That's when you went there to have fun. Now it's, it's, it's quite a bit different and it takes a lot of money and, and it kind of takes away from what it used to be and boy, I miss that because there were so many people, so many, you know, back then it was nothing for, uh, Don Garlitz came to uh, Minnesota Dragways in, in uh, I suppose the 59, 58, 59, 60 and, and you know, he was running on a shoestring at that time too because uh, I had the 40 Ford there, and him and his family were sleeping along the fence there. <laughs> it was just like I was. That was our Holiday Inn. You know? In a little tent. Yeah. 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 It, you know, it, it, it was, uh, but everybody helped uh, each other there again, get by. And, and I think that's what kind of made the sport really, really grow because it's just, it was something to read, to do, and, and to meet new people. Yeah, absolutely. And, so, and like-minded people. You know, I always talk about that here with the museum. When you get car people together, there's a special magic that happens. And it doesn't matter what your background is, if you were a doctor or a lawyer or if you were a garbage man, you know, or whatever. I mean, it's uh, there's a commonality in, in a brotherhood, sisterhood that comes with this car yeah. world, and that's what makes it so fantastic and, and such a wonderful hobby. Uh, if you could build a car right now, uh, unlimited budget, what kind of car would you build uh, today? Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, the, the, it's hard the, to ask the, the, a car the, the, guy that question. <laughs> you know, you know, uh, you know, I, you know what? Uh, I had won the the in '68 the championship. At back that time, the ruling was you, you can't bring the car back unless you can completely change it. In that there, and uh, I had already started on a a new car with a rear engine, just like Ermi uh, Moroso. Oh yeah, Ermi Moroso's uh, Golden yeah, Star. He, he's yeah. got the, the Ford I, I went to Ford to ask him to get an Indy, because I wanted an Indy engine, and this one, and this one's gonna be rear engine. And, uh, and uh, uh, they didn't, uh, I, I went. I went uh, Monday morning to Detroit and met with the big boys at the table. They gave you five <laughs> minutes to make your spiel, and, and uh, they called. They called me back about a month later, and they says, "We're kind of getting out of '69." Was kind of a year where they uh, said we're going to get get out of racing, uh, but they says you can have all the. 427 SOACs you want uh, from Holman and Moody, 
<laughs> in, in that there uh, for a special price. And at that time, uh, I had two of my friends, and so we bought three of them. Oh, wow. And I put, I put mine in the 48 Lincoln, and uh, Kurt, uh, we put Kurt's in a 63 Ford Fastback, and uh, then we put the other one for Minnesota Auto Specialties, we put that in a, in a, in a street tee, so. <laughs> I wonder if they'd let you still do that, go to Ford. I'd love to ask them for some more of those motors at that price you told me about. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, actually it was uh, Fran Hermandes, who was head of uh, Autolite division of Ford, and that there got me, to, got me in there to, to talk to them, so. Wow, I wonder, would have this been after the GT40 success? Because what year would have this been, Cy, that it, you were there? It would have been probably, uh, 68, 69, oh, yeah. probably 70. Yep, so they'd already had their big success with their GT40 and yeah. probably had some spare engines laying around and that, that's really fantastic. Yeah, that's that's neat, the fact that you could go ask for a camera and yeah. come away with a deal like that. <laughs> and obviously they were impressed. I think you told me that story that they were so impressed that you had built a car that was all Ford. It wasn't a mixture of you know Chevy and, and Dodge and all this other menagerie, it was all Ford. Well, you know, uh, the guys at the board, there must have been 12, 14 of them sitting around the table there. The two of them, uh, two of them uh, gave me the high sign on the, when I said, you know, I'd built this one here with uh, uh, Edsel and Lincoln and uh, all Ford body, you know, all steel body and everything and that there. And two of them gave me the high sign, you know. So, <laughs> That's uh, great. They kind of liked it better than if it had been uh, powered by Dodge or, <laughs> or, or Chevy, but. Oh, that's, that's fun. Well, I think the, the most fantastic part of this story is how the car has come full circle. You won the award with it and then you sold it right away somehow the car came back to you and you still have it in your life. Tell me about how this all worked out, because it's great. Well, at, at that time, uh, the wife, you know, I've, I've been 16 shows and, and she, you know, I'm raising a family and she says, I don't think it's about time to stay home and, and that there. And so I sold the car and it actually, the car actually ended up going to uh, a person out of Minnesota who ran the uh, uh, Canadian car, uh, fairs. It started on one side of Canada, all the way, and that uh, ran it all through the fairs. And the car ended up back in, in Denver, Colorado, and one guy came to me and he says, I think your car is in Denver. I said, really? Mm. And uh, I took some money and I told my wife, I said, you know, I'm going back to get it. I want it back. So I went back and, and found it. And uh, I had to spend most of the day getting it away from him. <laughs> but he had torn it all apart. The fenders were outside. You know, under ice, we had to chip them out with an ax. And, that there, and I don't know what this deal was going to do with it, but anyhow. It was a really a part. I just bought a U-Haul trailer and we put the stuff in it and I, I came home and put it back this way. And uh, I was gonna, this is the way it was gonna stay until 2006. And I and the wife both got cancer and we had a big bill at Mayo again. And uh, I told my boys, I said, you know, I'll give you guys the car if you'll just help me out with the bill of that there. Well, like the boys said, said at that time, you know, they'd had enough of it because we, uh, when they were young, I took them with me. I took them out of school and I took them to the Detroit, Milwaukee, Chicago, you know, and they had to poly help polish and all this here. <laughs> they, you know, they kind of, you know, uh, it wasn't their cup of tea at the time. And, uh, so I sold it to a gentleman in New Jersey and uh, 2000, 2019, my son, had, uh, oldest son had started a business in Northern Minnesota, done very well, 
Uh, and uh, he was getting set to get retired. He says, Dad, he says, you know, I was with that car all the time. And that said, where did it go? And I told him. And, he, and the guy said, uh, they made a deal. And uh, Bob, my son, said, we're buying it back, Dad. It's going to stay in the family. He says, that's, that's a part of us. Oh, well, they cool. helped me build the car. You know, when, when I was building it and that there, I had them, you know, putting the body on and <coughs> off it and that there. And they, they, you know, they were doing a lot of filing and, and drilling holes and, and holding stuff. And, uh, and so Bob bought it back and uh, then he passed away in 2020. And uh, he wasn't married and the, guess what? The, uh, his stuff came back to us. Here come the tea back again. Wow. <laughs> so he, so the, here's the tea back again. So it's just like the key it was supposed to be. Uh, come back to Minnesota and I'm so happy it's it's back in Minnesota again and well, that's a, that's a fantastic story because I think there are a lot of people that can relate that grow up with cars, maybe following their parents around, uh, going to car shows and whatnot, and, and they might almost have a sour spot in their heart for something at the time because it's taken up so much of their time or yeah. you know, so much of their childhood maybe, uh, but then to come full circle and say, no, I actually love that car and let's get it back, Dad, and that's, that's really cool. And the fact that it's here today and it's not changed, you know, that it's yeah. not you know, sitting here with a small block Chevy in it and a different uh, paint job, I mean, that it's the way you wanted it, that is somewhat of a miracle. Yeah, the paint, the paint on it is from was painted in 1988. Wow, it looks fantastic. It's yeah. got just enough character, you know, that you realize this is a this is yeah. a real historic uh, car, and it's, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah and you, you drive this thing. I mean, that's oh, no yeah. problem. Hop well, in that, and go that's for a why spin. I says, you know, that way I could drive it in a parade and don't have to be scared of scratching it. Yeah, you know, or something, or loading, unloading the trailer or something. That there, I can go and drive it. So yeah, absolutely. That makes it that makes it a lot of fun, you know. And having it, you know, you talked a little bit about, you know, your your sons being with you, you know, traveling the circuit, having it at different uh, car shows. That's where you met Mr. Bob Larravee because, of course, his connection oh. with the Detroit Autorama and the other shows. Yep. Tell me a little bit about your history with Bob. Maybe the first time you met him, and and uh, you know what that relationship was like. Well, I'll tell you, uh, he 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 was. You know, I showed for other pr producers and that there, but Bob was really different, you know. He was always, to me, I don't know, uh, so down to earth. You know, a lot, a lot of them, you know, you, you feel like you're taking their, your time by asking them a question. Bob, he'd come over and, and talk to you, hmm. you know, he, and, and he'd always say, how are you going? And then at the end of the show, it was always, uh, you know, I was getting, uh, packed up to go, here he come with some pizzas, you know? <laughs> so, you know, if it was, he made that ISCA circuit. He, he done such a great job at it. And uh, it was always neat to see him and, and talk to him. He always, he always had something going and that there was so interesting to. Oh yeah, yeah, he, uh, he you know, he always had this, sense about what people wanted to see or what would bring people to his events you know all yeah. the sideshow stuff you know like the the playmates or the yeah. you know the famous uh, movie stars that would show up at his uh, at his car shows but he obviously had good taste in cars too he knew the cars that people would want to see yeah. and that's where the relationship with you happened and and I think he also knew how to take care of those people so they'd want to keep coming back again and I'll never forget when Bob told me about you and and that's where I first learned your name he said Tim, have you ever seen uh, the Cubista uh, T? And I said, I've never heard of it. I, he said, I said, I'm kind of embarrassed. I don't know about this car. And he said, well, Tim, you should be. This is a really serious car. And he, and he showed me pictures of it. And then he told me about its Minnesota connection. And I just immediately fell in love. And, uh, you know, so to have you here, obviously, is a, 
It's a great triumph for the museum. We're super excited to tell your story. We're just getting started, of course, so uh, you know, we'll, we'll keep plugging away at it, and, and we're going to build a fantastic display for the car. And Are you going to come back and see us at Cars and Coffee? You betcha. <laughs> you betcha. Well, I hope so. Maybe this will just be one, the, this will be one in a series of videos we do, uh, just to kind of talk about your car. I know you've had a chance to wander around the museum. Is there anything that really uh, lit you up when you saw it? Oh, well, I'll tell you, that engine department, the, all them engines and that, there, that's my kind of cup of tea because there's stuff there, you know, I never knew was made, you know, and, and, and it, it was neat to see what a lot of other guys, how they engineered stuff, to get this, get about the same thing out of them, but the, how differently they've done it, you know. Yep, absolutely. And, and, uh, the, and uh, you know they they didn't go to to uh, t, uh, TV or anything uh, or come up bring it up on the internet to how to do it. You had to go if you want it done. You had to go do it. You're right, and you come from that world too. And yeah. I was going to ask you that, and something I forgot to ask earlier in the interview is, where did you get your original spark for cars? Uh, was your dad into old cars, or did he teach you how to build things, or how did that all get started? I was born, I was born and raised on a farm, and and that there, and you know, dad was pretty as far as farming, you know, and doing little things around the farm. You know, he was pretty good at that, but my biggest uh, my education, like, I go and talk to, uh, I'm a Korean veteran, and I go and talk to high school, uh, to different classes about the Korean War and, and how, how we got started and all that. And like I said, you know, my best teachers was, uh, uh, at that time was when I got out of high school, was the Ford Garage, and that there, there was eight other mechanics there were teachers. You know, they would come over and help, you know, you'd be over there struggling, trying to do something. They'd come over there and say, well, can't you find a different way to do that? Or how about <laughs> doing it this way? You know, that was my best teachers. Uh, the guys in that garage were fantastic. And then I got in service and uh, I put into the engineers and there, you know, we had some really good instructors as far as engineering. We were supposed to uh, build bridges. But then I actually got a job in a, a service for two years as uh, I was a, uh, head of the, uh, well, I was actually a motor sergeant, what they call a motor sergeant. And I had a bunch of trucks and vehicles to take care of. And uh, there I had to teach a lot of these guys how to drive a truck, how to double clutch, how to take care of a truck. And so I started by teaching there. And then uh, after uh, the state hired me for, uh, to teach uh, uh, kids 13 to 18 years old who were in trouble, were actually and that there. So, uh, I spent 27 years of teaching automotive repair. So it's like my wife always said, she says, you know, she always told the doctor, if you ever come to the hospital and needs a transfusion, you might as well put oil in him because he's, <laughs> all, he's always <laughs> he's always working on a, on a car. Or something oh, like. I love that! Yeah, that's fantastic. And your wife, she had to be pretty understanding of this whole car oh, world. Oh, I'll tell you what. You know, I, I just lost her in April, and uh, she'd be happy. Well, that makes me proud to hear and, you know, to be able to continue your story and, and keep this history alive. That's yeah. really what we're all about. And, and uh, you're just such a fantastic person. You've blown the doors off every one of my volunteers that's been around today showing you around because you, you tell them better stories than they can tell you here in the museum. So that says a lot about you. And well, it's, uh, that's pretty fantastic. But, you know, I can go around to the cars. A lot of the cars I've seen on the show circuit, I've seen at the drag races. You know, I, I can go right back and tell you, you know, you know, man, you know, I remember him doing this here. I, you know, it looks like our funds, you know. I was there in, 
in 56, you know, uh, when they ran to Kansas City, <laughs> you know, and, and uh, back then in the, in the pits, you know, you were all, you were all there and together and that there's a, you got, I had, I, I was very fortunate to be able to, you know, intermingle with all these people and uh, got a heck of an education and a lot of help. Oh yeah. So, we could even talk about your experience with Bill Smith, but we'll save that for video number two because that's pretty fantastic. You know, just the work you'd done uh, related to uh, the history of our business with Speedway Motors. They used to haul tea buckets around yeah. for uh, for Bill and taking catalogs out to California yeah. and just cool stuff. Yeah, yeah, I knew because I'd run into Bill at the at the swap meets and that there. I always seen him at Hershey, Hershey and Carlisle and. Uh, it was always fun to be, uh, you know, close to him because he attracted so many uh, people too. So while you were standing around talking to him, you got to meet some, uh, somebody else that he knew. So <laughs> it just uh, progressed through the whole way. So. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, Sai, first of all, thank you for your service, especially to the, the military in the Korean War. My grandpa also served in the Korean War, and, you know, that's, that's, that's amazing. And, you know, we're all so thankful for that. And, and thank you for coming to the museum. Thanks for bringing your fabulous car. We're excited to celebrate you, celebrate your accomplishments, and hopefully inspire the next generation. Because, really, if we can get some young people to put their cell phones down and go build something, I think we're all a little better off. And what's better than a hot rod? right so uh, <laughs> thank you so much my yep. friend this means the world to us and and uh, and we'll we'll keep talking and learn more later everyone out there joining us uh, here at the Museum of American Speed thank you so much and we'll see you next time uh, I would like to oh. say that thanks to Terry and Bonnie you know they've been such a help for help for me because I'm uh, I'm 90 years old and out there and I can't do it as fast as I use it I think I could could but it don't work that way. That's a really good point. You know, no person is an island. You need a good support system around you, you and people that understand and, and uh, that dig this stuff as much as we do. So uh, again, thanks everyone. Thank you, Cy. This is a real honor. And uh, we'll to, uh, have you tune in again next time uh, for some more stories from uh, the Museum of American Speed. Thanks everyone.